my name is Yasser Altaya. I'm from Syria and uh, now I'm in Germany because of the war. From Syria, I came from Golan Hills, but I lived in Damascus most of my life. It's like a ghost city. When I came to here in the beginning, I find that my, my neighbor is German people. So I was excited. I say sometimes, hello, and uh, they don't even look. After the sun set, everybody, they close the, their windows. And this is uh, quite strange for me in, the, in our street. You find only the, the, our house is with lights. I, I hear music. I hear like somebody shouting to somebody. Like this is the Arabic culture. Also, there's some uh, Arab people who lives in Germany like 30 years ago, more or less. And they come here just to drink tea, just to, to see. This guys, I don't know why they come here because they have their jobs, they have their, their cars, their, their, their children, their family. They have everything, but so, every week they have to come here. When we had just arrived into Dublin, the pilot said, I think he said, um, oh, it's a nice six degrees or so outside. And I thought, is that, is that nice? How is that nice? My name is Benita Mpatele, and I'm from South Africa. I am currently living in Ireland. I share the room with my mom, which is crazy. It's still not nice, because we're still living like that. It was. A year ago, uh, my mom first came to Ireland. She called me and she's like, hey, you should come over here for Christmas as well. After Christmas was over, she's like, hey, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll stay here for a bit. We can start school here. So that was really how it happened. I was just snatched out of the place, thinking I was coming back. So I didn't have a chance to sort of say goodbye to anyone, tell anyone I was leaving. There's that empty space that won't be filled, I guess. Moore Street. It's like I walked into a portal almost to back to South Africa. So my mom, she'd even make juice for us. She'd pick the fruits from the trees and we'd stand around waiting for her to make the juice. When she makes it, she just takes a net and she puts the fruits inside. She just squeezes them. Yeah, and it was so, so sweet. I can almost taste it now. We have to move really to to survive really or else, you know, there's nothing really at home for us. I did uh, real estate and at the time in Ireland was the thing to do, but by the time I finished it wasn't. Well, my name is Kevin Cohen. I'm from Belderin in County Galway and I live now in London. When I moved over here first, the winter was, was bad enough, you know, the weather was bad, it was a lot of snow, so. There was days I was out there and I was wondering what I was doing abroad in it, but winters wasn't as bad at home, do you know? Yeah, well, I was hurling all my life, really. When I started, it's nearly extinction of my hand since, since I was two or three years old, you know? All my family played hurling and played for the club and at home and played for Galway and that, so it was a sort in the blood, really, to, to continue on. I'm Molly Collins, and I'm here from 1971. Travelled around the country everywhere, north and south of Ireland. Well, I'm Missy Collins. I'm living here about 24 years. Our lifestyle changed when they started putting us into the piling us all up together. The house was lovely and comfortable, but it was hard to adapt to it. My mother even got hard. She used to say she was too much in it. But my always, my father always kept one horse and a cart. So when the summer had come down when the children would break off school, my daddy would lock the house up and we'd go on travelling. When I see the smoke coming up out of the chimneys, it brings back everything of the past when I was uh, going around the houses years ago. We'd get around the campfire and we had games to play, like 
We could be warm in the front of a winter's night and this, this frost sparkling down on top of our two shoulders. But we still didn't feel it because we were brought up that way. And we'd be telling stories, so we'd be singing, and we had names in the stars as well. There was a, a cluster of stars together. We used to call them the Seven Sisters. <laughs> If you wanted to get your winter swearing, you had to go to the bog and cut the turf. Oh, they looked cheerful in the house. The comfort of looking at it. I'm Tom McAvoy. I live in Plymouth Nice and a bridge. And I'm retired and um, I do farming still. And that's my life. Some people can't cut turf on bogs that they used to cut on because they're being pre preserved. And that's why my sons can't um, cut turf in the bog. That they were cutting yarn. Uh, it's in, been in my family for about 60 years now. An EU directive, like, you know, preserving bog, certain types of bog. My grandson told me that he was on the bog filling the trailer out of the turf in 2011. And uh, this chap came in with a lovely pinstripe suit on him and <laughs> collar and tie. And, a new pair of Wellingtons, and he said, uh, you'll have to stop cutting turf here. It's, this is the last year, so you're lucky, <laughs> you're lucky to be getting away with it this year, I suppose, you could say. And uh, so that was it then. After that, you didn't cut any more turf because you'd be in trouble. Back when we were young, Tom, you have a great old community spirit on the bog. Everyone oh, yeah. is cutting turf. Mm. You'll be cutting there, and I'll be cutting mm. here, and there'll be someone else, the whole... Yeah, crowded yeah. people don't about and we'd all go to each other when we'd have the chat and the mm. bit of crack and yeah. talk about the women and everything. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk for it. My father could talk for it. Yeah. Yeah. Had to be her own repairs here or got cracked. Had to be welded. That has some cut turf in. Thirty five years or so, wasn't it? Yeah. The piece on top there, the cow's horn, that was behind it to save a man's hand. You wouldn't get it as smooth and curled. Manpower. <laughs> As Tommy says, once that I had time. Four in the morning came in and they took over part of the bogs that the people used to cut turf on. I don't know how long they're going to last. They said they'll only last another few years. Four in the morning is a, a state-owned company and they give a lot of employment and all that sort of thing. And uh, of course they have the power, <laughs> shall we say. There's no one going to challenge them. It was, it was made for her by a friend. So he made a, this one-piece African dress. I didn't know that she had it until um, it was very warm and she whipped it out and put it on. And I was like, oh, that, that is home right there. Like immediately when I just see my mom walking around in that dress. The Indabella people have these little huts that they build. They paint these graphic shapes, these patterns on the sides of the huts. I thought I could do that as well, make a pattern that almost looked like the shapes on the Ndebele huts. I really wanted to get back into school because um, I knew once that, that happened, then I would kind of get back on track. Something would seem normal again. Now I feel I miss something. I don't know if I will keep fi missing this thing that is maybe the, the home. It's Arab shop. We have some papers, some special things. That's it's not exist here, but they bring it from from Syria or from Iraq. If you ask any Syrian about about Syria, they the first thing they tell you about the bread. Oh, you have bread in Syria. You will never have it here. The real, real bread, my, my grandmother do it. She makes a fire and she sit on the ground. Here, we don't have this materials. So we just do it with the, with the ban <laughs> or with anything that griddle. My mother know how to do it. But now my sisters, they don't know. Our seed and breed was travellers on the side of the road and whatever. But that doesn't say that my family 
although they never travelled, a day and a half travel. Yeah, the teacher was talking about making the tea one day in the school and all the little settled girls go up and put the tea bag in the cup or whatever. She wouldn't, the girl wouldn't get up and do the tea the way that we'd make the tea. Her mommy turned around and said to her, well, you should have, you should have done it, Samantha, she said, because that's our way, that's the way we do it. You wouldn't ask, did you drink it black or white? But it'd be a lovely tea now. And you'll be putting out this now, you say, well, leave us up there for your father or he'll kill us when he, when he comes back. And you say, make sure and keep it there for our John or our Paddy or, or if you don't leave him, if you don't leave him some of the bread, he'll kill us. We had it all off without kind of a way of, of acting. <laughs> it, it took the worry out of you. Other lads, they're on the London panel. They, they come from East London, South London, so they could be travelling an hour, hour and a half every night, so they have long days, you know. Just, it was what I always dreamed of to, to play for Galway, so that was... didn't really dream to play for London or anything, but... <laughs> hurling, you win with the 15 or you lose with them, so... At least you're not on your own. Yeah, just the pitch is it's like the same pitch you get at home, like it's the same size, same goal, so it's like being at home really when you'll be out in it, yeah. My, my lads will never worry about the ball. That year was gone now, it's gone. It's, it's, not, it's not in their psyche, it's not in their memory like it's in mine. No. Oh, yeah. They have they have no growth for the bog. The lark would be rising and singing in, in, in leaving time there. Yeah, it could go up so high. It could go Aye, up. Yeah, hard to see them. Yeah. Yeah. That's all part of history now. That's all yeah. in the past. My weary hands are blistered from toil in cold and heat. And oh, to swing aside today in fields of Irish wheat. Had I a chance to journey back or own a king's abode, I'd rather see the hot arm tree down the old bog road.